Hello, I'm Peter Towers, the Managing Director of ESS BizTools. Welcome to the ESS BizTools Business Advisory Services podcast. Today, I'm joined by Paul Barnaby. Paul's the Managing Director of Beyond Accounting Technologies and the uh, Australasian representative uh, and an Asian representative for uh, Plan Guru. How are you today, Paul? I'm just great. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for inviting me along. Yeah, um, I thought we'd discuss uh, predictive accounting today, uh, budgets, cash flow forecasts, projected balance sheets. Um, you have a, a passion for this sort of work, don't you? I, I absolutely do, uh, Peter. I've, um, I've specialised in this area for uh, um, thinking into 20 years now. It's all I do. And it's especially I developed uh, when I could see that there was a, a big need for it. Uh, when I was in uh, in general practice as an accountant, um, but now it has been my specialty, and uh, that's all I do. Predictive so, do you want to account. want to explain to our listeners just what's involved in predictive accounting? Okay, well, predictive accounting is exactly like historic accounting. It is producing financial statements, which we're trained to do, profit and loss and balance sheet, but with a very important difference, a cash flow report. But we do it for future periods instead of historic, historic periods. Hmm. Now, it's been easy for a long time to do the historic accounting, but it's not been easy to do the predictive accounting because uh, we don't have uh, a, a zero myob QuickBooks equivalent straight up uh, for the predictive accounting. And so uh, it's been a little bit harder to find uh, purpose-built tools, but there are tools out there and you must use tools. So that's what predictive accounting is. Doing in the future, for accounting statements, what we're used to doing in the past. But it's not starting with uh, last year's figures and adding 6%. Uh, uh, no, no. Obviously, history we have a mind uh, for. We, we need to, uh, and in terms of balance sheets, obviously, we must start from an op mm. opening position. But no, when I first learned budgeting, that's exactly what I was told. Take last year and uh, add or subtract a bit. Well, come on, Peter, a good guess might do you better than that. That's right. Mm. Okay, so uh, you're looking at the various components of the business, the units of production, the labour team, the um, time taken to sell, uh, debtors days outstanding, all those issues you're factoring into the budget preparation and the cash flow. Exactly right. And that's what the tool should allow you to do. It's what I call key drivers. Mm. But if you translate that to a line by line uh, in your income statement, profit and loss, balance sheet, et cetera. It's looking at those key drivers. What, what drives this line? What drives the revenue line? We might need to have multiple revenue lines for our products or services groups. We might even need to have multiple budgets for the multiple business units that there might be. I, I'm looking at a simple, uh, you might think, case study of a secondary college but they actually have 60 departments, <laughs> 60 departments that they huh. want separate budgets for huh. because they've got 60 different people. It's quite a big college that are responsible for each of those. And, and that's why. So it's, it's horses for courses. You've got to look at the detail, but every line must have that key driver. And is uh, the concept of predictive accounting, uh, I know, is linked back to the business plan, isn't it? Oh, oh, indeed it is. Whatever the strategies of the business owner or owners must translate through into those financial, predicted financial statements. Hi, hmm. it's live. Unfortunately, over the years, I've seen some uh, um, projections in budgets and cash flows that are not reflected uh, in the business plan. Well, it's amazing that that should happen, but yes, I have seen it also more mm. than once. Yeah. Mm. 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 Mark, uh, Mark Holton uh, made a comment on a podcast that I had with him a couple of weeks ago that um, um, he doesn't think accountants are systemized enough when it comes to looking at services like business advisory services. Mark made the comment that in 25 years of going into accounting firms, to assist them with changing what they were doing. 
he believes that every one of those firms did some aspect of business advisory services or what we now call business advisory services. But he said none of them had a system. And he, and he gave an example. Um, when he talked to firms, most of them had done budgets and cash flows, but none of them volunteered that they'd instigated that requirement with the client. It had come from a request from the bank or a lender or the client themselves because the bank wanted it. And he then made a comment that he believed there should have been a, a, a policy then put in place by that firm to say to the client, well, we think you should now get quarterly financials mm. so that we can have a quarterly business review meeting so we can sit down and work with you to see how everything's going. So is that what you think accountants should be doing? Oh, absolutely, Peter. And I've been dealing with accounting firms in this area for just about the same length of time as Mark. Um, so I can understand where he's coming from. And what I call it is reactionary services. They're reacting to a external motivation. In this case, as you say, the bank or the lender, whereas it should be proactive. They should have been offering that service. But just to add a little bit more anecdote to it, a typical discussion I have with accounting firms is I'll ask them the question, do you do predictive accounting? Do you do budgets and cash flows? Oh, yes. When do you do it? Um, when the client asks for it? Okay. And why does the client ask for it? Because the banks asked for it. Yeah. And what happens when you've completed the budget? What do you do with it? Oh, we give it to the client. And what do they do with it? They give it to the bank. Well, don't you think it sets up an opportunity to have an ongoing dialogue with that client? I was talking to somebody the other day who agreed with me, they are in general practice, over 90% of their clients in small businesses don't make wages for the industry that they're in. Mm. They don't make that level. Is there a call for budgeting there? Should the accountant be proactive and say, hey, I can show you ways how to increase your profits so at least you're making some money instead of going home at night absolutely done thinking I've only made two-thirds of a fair, fair wage today. Mm. So there's many, many reasons to have that system in place. And in my view, it should be the part of the core service. Yeah. It, should, it shouldn't be optional. This is what we do for you. Sure, we do the historic accounting. Sure, we do the compliance and tax. But yes, in our advisory services, budgets and cash flows, the whole predictive accounting is a must because without it, we can't work with you. Mm. And if you don't want to do it, maybe you need to go somewhere else. Yes, and um, in another one of our podcasts in the last couple of weeks, Andrew Geddes was our uh, uh, keynote commentator mm -hmm. sitting in the chair you're now sitting in. And he made the comment that if accountants are serious about delivering business advisory services, they may need to cull some of their clients Absolutely. because uh, uh, the time you're going to have to spend on a client that currently might only pay five to $10,000 in fees, it could blow out to 50,000 if you're offering a proper service. Hmm. And um, obviously that, that's uh, uh, 10 uh, or five of those previous clients that you had in, in volume. So you've hmm. suddenly increased. And if you're going to give them the service, you need to have less. So it's interesting, I, isn't it? I think the comment I would make too, Peter, is when it comes to business advisory services, too little is made by the accountants themselves of the way they market. For example, if you told a client, we are going to double your profit, but it will cost you $10,000. And the client says, oh, I'm never going to pay $10,000. What about if I guarantee that if you pay me $10,000, I'll double your profit? So you'll have, instead of $50,000, you will have $100,000. And I've guaranteed that. So is your $10,000 fee for me a risk? No way. So there's a simple thing. Guarantee. I guarantee that it'll work. Hmm. You've got to... Let's put it in the vernacular. You've got to have the guts to put your money where your mouth is mm. and show these clients that you can actually do that. I think too many accountants don't think they can deliver, so they don't deliver in case they get judged. Mm. Yeah, interesting point. Mm. That might provoke some comments from the people listening to this podcast. Oh, I we, hope it does. We, because We I... look forward to hearing from them. <laughs> yes. Because this is important and it's serious.
Hmm. Um, and and you, when you look at accountants going forward, especially if accountants want to have control of this advice area to SMEs, which the ComBank reports are identifying is the growth area Absolutely. for accountants. They're not, they're not going to grow in tax work. There's more and no. more of it going offshore. It's a little bit more difficult to outsource business advisory services out over overseas, isn't it? I wouldn't even try. Hmm. Yeah, some components might be able to, but yeah, I think it's a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more interaction required with the client. Um, there's this concept of business plans and they should not just be run off a machine. They've got to be thought through. The brain's got to be used. Yeah, and it's too personal a thing. It's got to be done in the boardroom of the client or the office mm. of the client, mm. not by an office in Manila. Mm. Because the client needs ownership of all these predictive accounting reports at the end of the day, don't they? Exactly. And that's exactly. why it's important that they're involved in the discussions, mm -hmm. especially in those key driver type settings. Exactly right. Yep. Because that's looking at their labour manning, their production, their electricity usage, their gas usage, all these sorts of things mm -hmm. should be factored into there. And the client's the one that's probably got the best idea of what all that's, what does, what's going to be involved in their business. Absolutely. Yep. Paul, we might turn to another subject, if you like. And um, I was quite uh, surprised, but probably not that surprised, when I read a report in the Financial Review about uh, six weeks ago, which was attributed to Johnny Wilkinson. Johnny Wilkinson is the joint founder of Equitize, uh, mm -hmm. Australia's joint leading crowdsource funding intermediary. They originally started their business in New Zealand because they got frustrated hanging around Sydney, waiting for crowdsource funding to be legalised. So they went across to New Zealand. It's because the New Zealand government introduced crowdsource funding over there about six years before Australia did. But nevertheless, Wilkinson's released a very interesting report. The first one I've seen that an intermediary is actually released to the, to the market and said that the intermediaries were only um, accepting as being bona fide a, uh, inquiries about raising crowdsource funding from 5% of the people who um, contacted them, 5%. And out of that figure, uh, only 76% of the 5% uh, actually raised capital. I think that's a very poor reflection on small businesses, small companies in Australia, but probably a very poor reflection on the accounting profession because either these, these client, these companies didn't go and talk to their accountant about it. And if so, why not? Do they think their accountant's not interested in what they do in this very important area of raising capital? Or I probably hope they didn't go and talk to the accountant and what, what they took to the intermediary was the results of work done for them by their accountants. But what do you think? I, I thought 5% was a ghastly result. Uh, that is my immediate reaction, Peter. I, I cannot understand why it is so small, because from my understanding of the crowdsourced funding, while it is not uh, a, a row of skittles, um, it is not an impossible task, and it's a very, very um, available area for smaller business. To be, to be raising capital, which they otherwise might find difficult um, within traditional traditional lenders. So I'm with you. I don't think they will have approached their accountants. But here's the other um, uh, probably out there statement I'm going to make today. The problem is in recent years, and I'm going to say the last 10 years, there has been so much um, in the accounting profession reliance on compliance and tax work only that they have created the impression among their clients that that's all they do. Yeah. They yeah. don't do the other stuff. So I can understand that they wouldn't ring them to say, hey, I'm after crowdsource funding. Can you help? Mm. Because they've probably already said to themselves, oh, God, no, they wouldn't know a thing about that. Mm. That's right. But and this is a real is, challenge, isn't it? Oh, absolute challenge. And, and again, I, I find it, uh, so um, surprising that accounting firms aren't making this realisation. I mean, would you like to think you're going to spend the rest of your life filling out government forms? 
Well, I don't, but <laughs> no. I, I don't even do my own anymore. Um, so uh, I didn't set out to be provocative today, but, but that's what it's all about. I mean, if yeah, they well, don't think they can do it, they're not going to ask them to do it. Yes, and um, I hope to interview Johnny Wilkinson in one of these podcasts Good. In, the next, in the next couple of weeks, and then I'm going to invite uh, uh, one of the directors from uh, uh, Birchall, who's the, the other major intermediary mm -hmm. virtuals in melbourne to also appear and give us their overview but i know virtual were making some similar comments about uh 12 months ago mm -hmm. and uh, so i suspect their answer is going to be basically the same because when you really read johnny wilkinson's comments i think he's contacted some of the other intermediaries he he indicates that five percent is what the intermediaries received and yep. just to not to knock crowdsource funding because the capital raise in the last 12 months went up 125 percent oh great and um but that was for 65 companies raised mm. 46 million dollars so it's not a huge amount there's not no. there's only been a couple of companies raised the full five million dollars mm. The average raise is around seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollars people can keep on going back and the intermediaries are probably encouraging them to do that uh, because they can market and promote a, a, a smaller package. They get the investors in. The average investment amount is tends to be running about two or three hundred dollars per investor. Um, so there's probably a fair chance that in a year's time they'll come back and invest another two or three hundred dollars in a company if they're happy with it. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's an interesting uh, position. But on my reckoning, about 1,560 companies, when you interpolate the figures, 65 equal 3.6% and do it backwards, I got 1,560, 1,560 probably started the journey that never never even got a Guernsey to play in the game. And I think that's, that's it, it, it's nearly as bad as the, as the debtors days outstanding, that we've got the longest yeah. debtors days day outstanding in the world. It's too... Mm -hmm statistics that I don't think we should have any pride in as far as accounts. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Mm. So uh, I'm hopeful that the accountants who are listening to this conversation don't say, oh, that's just a couple of old so-and-so is having a whinge. And <laughs> they, they look at it seriously and say, okay, what is going on? Um, yeah. Only 65 companies out of 1,600-odd uh, were successful in mm. raising this money. You're right. It's 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 not doing an IPO, initial public offer on a mm. stock exchange. It hasn't got that degree of due diligence, but there is obviously supervision by the intermediaries. Their responsibility is to try to ensure that the companies that they approve, because they're the approver on behalf of ASIC, uh, have got some legitimate uh, business proposition that they're mm. presenting. The government gave them that role um, they, because uh, they're experienced in this industry and the government doesn't want to see um, everyday um, ordinary investors lose their money and, uh, unnecessarily, if I can put it like that. Mm -hmm. they, I think everyone accepts that in some businesses there will be failures, but um, we want to make sure the uh, they're going to get the best possible run. So that's the intermediary's role. But I would have liked to have heard that, you know, if that figure had been that they knocked back uh, 20%, I think I would have said, okay, 80% got a Guernsey, they're in the game. Mm. But when mm. you hear that only 5%, that's that's pretty low figures, isn't it? It's awfully low. Yep. Mm. So, so that we get our message across to the accountants listening, What's needed? I think there's, obviously there needs to be a business plan that is coordinated with the budgets, the cash, the predictive accounting reports, budgets, cash flows, and projected balance sheet. Um, I think a lot of the SME companies that are looking at crowdsource funding should have a mentoring session with an accountant. And, and if if the listeners can't do it, and the area I'm talking about is corporate governance, please find someone at Canon if you. Want to talk to me? I'm sure you, Paul, mm. on corporate mm. governance. Please contact us, and yep. we can arrange that uh, to consult to your clients. But there's also a necessity for a marketing report to be done because 
what's the basis for any of the figures contained in the business plan in any case, and then reflected in the budgets and cash flows. So there's a whole process of work that's necessary there. The, the end document that's got to be prepared is the crowdsource funding offer document. It includes a fair bit of legalese, history of the directors mm -hmm. and the and the key executives and all that but it's then based on what's in the business plan budgets and cash flow mm -hmm. forecasts mm -hmm. uh, as you'd expect yep absolutely right mm. Mm. okay so we might have more on that um what the other area i had noted here paul was um this general coordination of predictive accounting with the business plan in the first place uh, you, you concur with that, that it all starts with the business plan and then works on? Oh, absolutely. And, and if I can just go back to words I used before, the systemization. So mm. when you take taking business advisory services to your clients, part of that systemization is the predictive accounting. Mm. And, it's, and it's got to start right from, as we said before, that dialogue, making sure the client owns it and preparing the documents. So the predictive accounting reports are only part of the whole. So, so the, 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 the whole management plan uh, is part, part of the whole. Yeah. And, and, and they all should, should tie up. Um, so once the strategies are put in place, so they can be discussed, they can be quantified. Again, if there's the right tools employed in the practice, those what ifs can be done. So the strategies can be done and looked at and assessed before the business plan is even written. Mm. So it's no good just writing a business plan based on what's happening today. It's assessing where we should be going down, sorry, up, not down, obviously. Um, and what are the strategies that are going to take us up and create that scenario that gives that result for the shareholders and owners of, of the business. Uh -huh. So it gets right down to that detail of those strategies. Then the business plan can be written. Hmm. Then, then the financial reports, the predictive accounting reports can be created um, and, and summaries, et cetera, submitted to whoever it's going to be submitted to. Okay. Paul, let's look more at this systemization tools for predictive accounting. Um, Plan Guru is the uh, software of choice that you're involved with. Absolutely. And uh, the other side is is the the training, and I know you're doing that through your company, Beyond Accounting Technologies. That's right. You just want to give us an overview of how you work with Plain Guru and what you do in the uh, uh, training process. Absolutely, it's um, there's a number of aspects to it. Uh, Plain Guru, just to dwell a moment, is is a US based company that specializes in predictive accounting software. That's all they do. Hmm. And, and they have, in my view, the out and out best tool available when you compare its features and capabilities um, with its cost. It has quite a modest cost, um, but it has very, very uh, strong capabilities. Um, and just to put that into context, um, Plan Guru costs around $100 a US a month for a core, for a core license. Um, an equivalent product uh, that you can get out there is around 50,000 US. <laughs> and yeah. that's, per, that's per annum. That's not once. Um, so that puts it into context. The second aspect of Plan Guru that I like is that it is what you want it to be. If you want to prepare a quick budget in 30 minutes based on a few income and cost lines and a core balance sheet, you can do that. And out comes your result. You can see it. If you want to do... Uh, 30 business units and consolidate them across different countries with different um, currencies, you can do that also. But the key aspect that I bring to Plan Guru is not only do I look after their uh, affairs uh, in, the, in the time zone down here, but I teach people how to be predictive accountants. Give them the software, look at other tools that might be necessary. And uh, as you're very, very well aware, and by the way, I think I'm just about to get the first sign up. Um, of the joint venture. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, um, where uh, what we've done, Plan Guru have uh, heavily discounted their uh, product for advisors. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, ESS Biz Tools, uh, your good self, Peter, provides excellent documentation and systemization for the whole process of predictive accounting, budgets, cash flows, things like uh, charge out rates for professional firms, tradies, or, or what have you. 
balance sheet items, work in progress, that sort of stuff. Um, and I provide training. In the case of advisor firms, I do that training one-on-one. -on -one. So they don't need to worry about competitive uh, aspects. I do it with them online, one-on-one -on -one, and case study based. So it's very real, very timely. And at the end of it, they end up with a, a certificate, as it says on my background there, a, a certificate in, product, in productive accounting. And all at a very, I think, very modest cost. Mm. Mm. Okay. So that's very interesting. And Plain Guru, they're, they're, uh, well, they're, they're a company that's spread their uh, influence around the world, haven't they? Oh, absolutely. They're based in the US, uh, but uh, they're available. They're very strong in US, Canada, UK, New Zealand, Australia, but they're available in 50 countries around the world and okay. uh, have quite a number of users around the world. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, you want to tell us a bit more about the Certified uh, Predictive Accountant course? Well, it's, it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a play on words, become a CPA, um, but uh, no, there's a serious aspect to it. I think if you, if you go to the trouble of running through that process that I just outlined in the, in the training, it would instill in each advisor that process, that form, that context, uh, and in particular, the dialogue with the client, because it's not about using a piece of software. It's about the process of creating those predictive financial statements mm. and creating them from those key drivers and, and then making certain that you do those regular reviews. As you've heard me say before, what's the use of a budget just prepared in dollars without something driving it? Mm. If you don't achieve the budget, what went wrong? You have got no idea. So, so it's more about a process. And so being a certified predictive accountant, you know what that process is. You know what to do and when. Um, one of the things that Plan Guru does really well, for example, is um, automate as much data entry as possible. So you can have, if you like, hourly updates from Xero or QuickBooks Online or what have you and, and run comparative reports whenever you like. That's the sort of stuff that they do really well because they want you to be that predictive accountant they don't want you to be a data entry operator mm. so again it comes back to my whole theory that it's that process of taking that delivery to the client that's meaningful to them and pays off gives them that 10 times reward on the cost they pay you yeah and it's the um the systemization isn't it if, if data's coming on in on the hour and being analyzed and looked at um, I suspect that's what a lot of accountants in public practice don't appreciate is happening in industry. I know you've spent time in industry and I've spent yes. time in industry and key performance indicators are very important in, a, uh, in any, any sort of production process. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our colleagues who have spent their careers working in a, a public accounting chartered firm office in lots of cases, I don't think really understand how the key performance indicators are being used by their clients because they're basically getting the information in a set of financial accounts is where they start from. And then mm -hmm. they're preparing tax returns. Is that being unkind, me saying that? No, it's not being unkind. And it, it even goes back to the, to the universities. I was amazed to hear recently that Universities in Victoria, or at least one or two, don't teach basic debit, credit, bookkeeping. They say, go and get, go and get uh, Mile, go and get QuickBooks. It does it for you. Now, how can you possibly understand historic accounting, let alone predictive accounting, if, if you don't know where the debits and the credits go? Mm. Absolutely mm. amazing. But yes, I agree with you. It is a, a, a great asset to be an advisor if you have already worked in commerce out in the real world and looked at things like, as you say, the KPIs. So this is why it's so important because a lot of our audience listening to these podcasts might not have done that, or if they did, it was back in their university holiday mm. days or things mm. like that, and um, might not have understood the, the reason for a lot of the information that's being kept in supermarkets and production plants and all sorts of things mm. um, to do with quantities of fuel being all used, electricity being consumed, just the production throughputs on a day and every hour. Absolutely. Um, retailers 
a lot of retailers like knowing what the sales are every hour on every cash register, don't they? Yeah, and that's right. a lot of that's to do with A, to measure how the sales are going for the day, but secondly, to work out their labour manning requirements. Mm -hmm. um, do they find that the, the registers are not very busy between 10 and 11.30? Well, they can probably change their rostering or mm. run, run staff training. They can do things, but they mm. need that information, don't they? Mm. Absolutely right. Mm. Okay, Paul. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity of having this discussion today and exploring where predictive accounting fits in this overall work opportunity that is there for accountants to be offering value-added services to their clients. Thank you for the opportunity, Peter, and I hope we've provoked some thought on, uh, on maybe some people taking that leap and uh, getting into predictive accounting. Yes, and if anyone wants to... Um, talk to us about these or start it off by sending me an email please peter at essbiztools.com.au and i'll be quite happy to uh, have a podcast interview with people accountants bookkeepers business advisors chief financial officers servicing the sme market if you think that uh, we've been a bit unfair to you in some of these comments or you've got some alternative views because I think it's important that the, the profession discusses these issues hmm. and, and really appreciates that the SME market, and there's thousands of them, there's a couple of million of these businesses, can, can get more advice than filling in a form that's required for the tax office and the government. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Advice which will help them add value. And if Andrew Geddes was here, he'd be saying, if you're doing this sort of work, you're making it interesting and challenging, it will help you attract the accountants and will help you retain your current accountants because they'll be uh, undertaking some interesting work. Mm, quite right. Thanks, Paul. I'll catch okay. up with you later on, eh? Okay, Thank you, thanks, everyone. Paul. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. Bye.